When the Champlain Towers collapsed, 101 people fell with it. 98 of them died. Three survived the fall. Most people already know about Jonah Handler. The 15-year-old was pulled from within the rubble, a lone news camera capturing the heroic moment he was carried to safety in the arms of a firefighter. Those images were broadcast around the world, and the story of how Jonah held his dying mother's hand as he was lifted to safety became one of the tragedy's most enduring storylines. But on the other side of the pile, away from the cameras, two other victims survived after falling more than five stories from their ninth floor condo. They suffered horrendous injuries when they landed on the pile below. One was Angela Gonzalez. When I see videos of the collapse, it's still shocking yeah. for me because you're my mind just always goes to how did we even survive that? Yeah. It's just like, it's mind boggling. The other was another 15 year old, Angela's daughter, Devin. I remember falling for a brief second, yeah. And then I uh, just blacked out. Scarred and battered for a year, she's dealt with the physical and emotional toll from the collapse. I have to remind myself that like, I'm okay. Like I'm here now and I'm not where I was that night. She has struggled with the loss of her father, who died when the building came down, and wonders what he would say to her today. That's a really hard question. I honestly don't know. I'm pretty sure he would give me like words of encouragement, but I don't, I don't know. Amid the pain and grief, Devin's story is ultimately a story of survival, as she sets out to reclaim at least a part of the life she had before her world came crashing down. There's always like a solution. There's always some way to work through it, even if it's not the outcome you would have wanted or um, like you thought it was going to be. You still like keep going because giving up isn't an option. It's never an option. For the Gonzalez family, June 24th was like any other night. I had like a really intense volleyball schedule. <laughs> Playing volleyball at a high level was not just the guiding principle in Devin's life, but it also consumed her parents who wanted their daughter to succeed. You know, I had a workout, I had a vertical training, then I had my private, then I had beach practice, and by the time beach practice was over, it was like six or seven, and then I got home and my mom was there, my dad was working a little bit later that day, so he just decided to order pizza for us, and then when he got home, um, we just decided to like all watch a movie. And what movie did you watch? It was The Conjuring. <laughs> my mom likes horror movies. <laughs> By the time the movie was over, it was like about 12.30. It was really late. We all went to sleep. I was sleeping with them because I, I didn't like horror movies. I didn't want to sleep alone that night, and thank God I didn't. Because if I was in my room, I probably wouldn't have made it. Less than an hour later, the 15-year-old was awakened to her mother Angela standing over her. I woke up to my mom like pulling me out of bed and like saying, run. It was just like a crash that woke me up. Um, and all I had time was just to grab her. You know, I can't really tell you, I knew exactly what was going on, but it, it was, yeah, life or death, run for your life. The building, you could just tell the building was coming down. With no time to explain, Angela lifted Devin out of the bed and began running with her in her arms. All I can do was just, in my sleep, wake up and in a millisecond, just see what was happening and just, pick her up in those first few steps, just kind of stumbling with her um, until she finally kind of woke up. Yeah, and then started running with me. So we maybe only got a few steps out of the bedroom. The first part of it's a little blurry. I started waking up when I think we almost tripped trying to run out of the bedroom. And that's when I like I fully woke up and like started running with her. And then uh, there was like one last like 
boom or crash. I'm guessing that was like the last part of the building coming down and then like we fell over because of it because we lost our balance and then the floor caved in. Angela and Edgar Gonzalez lived in Unit 904 on the north side of the Champlain Towers with their daughters, Devin and Taylor. Edgar and Angela's bedroom was here while Devin and Taylor shared the bedroom next door. At 1.22 a.m., the central portion of the building collapsed into a hole that opened when the supports in the underground garage gave way. As it fell, it dragged down more and more of the building until the final section closest to the ocean came down. Here it is again from Angela and Devon's side of the building. Inside Unit 904, Angela likely was awakened by the initial rumblings of the columns failing. Grabbing Devon, she ran out of the bedroom, down the hall, and was trying to make it to the front door when the unit split in half, causing her and Devon to fall backwards, landing more than 60 feet below onto the debris pile. With the building sliced open like the back of a dollhouse, you can actually see what remained of Devon's bedroom. Fortunately for Taylor, she was out with friends that night. Devon said she remembers falling, but doesn't recall hitting the ground. It was probably like too much stress, so usually your brain shuts down after it's exposed to too much stress. And what's the next thing you remember? Um, I woke up. It was like, it was, it was dark. There wasn't like a lot of light. There were some lights in different areas. I woke up to the sound of my fire alarm go going off. It was just like blaring and I just like kind of like woke up and um, I don't know, I was laying down and I was like confused of what was going on. Angela also remembers falling. She believes Devin and her grabbed on to one another as they dropped. When her and I fell, I had grabbed her and we just were falling and I hit something. I have a huge um, gash on my back. Devin landed on top of her mother and the impact separated the two of them, causing Devin to roll partway down the pile about 20 feet away. So I had a basically a shattered pelvis so they had to do reconstructed surgery on my pelvis i had a um, lacerated liver a lacerated bladder devon suffered a compound fracture of the femur in her left leg i remember seeing like a piece of a like i don't i guess it was like a piece of concrete on specifically the left leg because i could still feel my right leg and then like when i moved the thing off i saw that like my bone was sticking out one way and then the other side of the bone was sticking out the other way. And then like, I just like couldn't feel my leg. So I kind of knew something was wrong. And it was like really, really painful to keep moving it because I don't mean to get graphic, but like everything from the knee to the foot moved in a different direction than what I would move my thigh. So it would be like moving two different body parts at once. And it was really painful. But I noticed the longer I held the leg up, the more it would like bleed. So, and I knew that was like not a good sign. Then there was like a metal rod stuck in my hair. It was like probably like that big. And then like I had to yank it out. It was not the funnest thing to do. Devin called out for her mother and could hear her, but couldn't see her in the darkness. But that's the part where I was kind of going in and out of consciousness, but um, I can hear her screaming for me and that would kind of pull me back up. Um, and I think I just kind of would ask her how she doing. I think at one point I told you to lay down, to lay down take some deep breaths, uh, help was coming. That help would come from a trio of firefighters from Engine 19 in North Miami. This truck is a busy truck. So that day was, quite honestly, it was a routine, busy day. Miami-Dade Fire Lieutenant Corey Jones, along with firefighters Tyler Tomsick and Scott Walker, recalling the hours leading up to the collapse. Station 19 is one of the oldest firehouses in the county and one of the busiest because of its location in North Miami, just off I-95. Their shift started at 7 a.m. on June 23rd, and by midnight they had already been on at least 20 calls just the typical calls we run, which would be medical calls, um, car accidents. A lot of car accidents that day. We had a bunch of car accidents. We had a fire, a little fire. Um, just a typical day, but busy. By 1.30 a.m. on the 24th, Tomsick was sleeping in his bunk, Jones was working on reports, and Walker was up watching TV when the call came in for Surfside. The initial call 
was it was a garage collapse. Attention, Low Hazard Building Collapse, 88th Street, Collins Avenue. 88th Street, Collins Avenue, advising a garage collapse. We've had collapses before, and it ends up being a ceiling comes down. When we got into the truck, the first arriving unit gave his size up, and he made sure to make sure that everybody knew that it was actually the whole building, and it wasn't just the garage. And he said, send everyone. Send everyone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And you knew it was, it was for real. Yeah. This is going to be a high priority. Uh, we're going to need TRT. We're going to need a full assignment on this, everybody. They arrived on the scene about 15 minutes later. Aerial 19, arrival. Hey, fire arrest is here. Come in, Aerial 19. Give me an assessment of the building. It was eerily quiet. There was debris in the air just floating everywhere. Um, you could tell right away that it was this was for real. And um, I think we, we didn't speak. We didn't speak on the walk up to the building. I just had a fire center tell me that the uh, part of the building collapsed. We're receiving yeah. different calls from different apartment numbers of people advising that they're trapped inside their apartment. Amid those chaotic first moments, fire commanders took charge. Just keep everybody in front of the fire truck, everybody behind this fire truck, everybody behind your police vehicles. Because Jones and her crew were part of the specialized technical rescue team, they were told to scout the collapse site to see what they were dealing with. We made our way to that south side of the building, um, which is where the parking garage was. We were scanning with flashlights, and we could see that there were um, people who were stuck in the back. They weren't injured. Aero 19, we're on the Charlie Delta corner. We have multiple victims outside of the building. They had brought themselves down the stairs, and um, we had to find a way to get to them and to get them to the front. After rescuing those six people, the crew turned their attention to the five-story pile of rubble in front of them. The remaining portion of the building towered above. They knew it could fall at any moment, killing all of them. The building is at risk for a further collapse. As we started to climb it, um, I remember Scotty turned back to me and said, hey, this could be it. And I said, I know, we got a job to do. And he goes, okay. And that was it. What did you mean by that? The remaining build, building could collapse at any time. And there was also debris falling, you know, from, you know, pieces of concrete that were still hanging, uh, you know, furniture or, you the know. The AC units. Yeah, air stuff. conditioning, stuff yeah. like that. And so I, you know, I was like, well, <laughs> I, I think out of all, you know, in my career, that's probably the, the, the hairiest moment, you know, I've had. There was never a question um, in my mind that we weren't going. We have a job to do and there's lives to be saved and that's why we were doing what we were doing. As they made their way up the pile, they spotted Devin. One of us said, oh my God, or holy crap, there's a there's girl. There's a girl. And she was sitting there from what I remember. Mm -hmm. Yes. Covered in dust, blood, a little bit yep. of debris, and just kind of looking down. In shock. Correct. Yeah. And so we attempted to make our way to her, which was. It took a long time. It took a while, crawling over concrete, rebar sticking out everywhere, everything was unstable. Uh, we did our best to get to her. I, I remember we kind of just asked her the usual questions we'll ask on a call and you're just trying to keep things as light as possible. What's your name? <laughs> What's your name? How old are you? Yeah. Type of thing. And she remarks, um, I have a tournament this weekend. I play volleyball. I kind of laughed and said, you're not going to make your tournament, sweetie, but we are going to get you out of here. She said, my mom's around here somewhere. And then, you know, and, and we're thinking it might have been, you know, at one point, but, you know, she's probably buried, you know, under all this debris. I told all of them, OK, now that you found me, you got to go find my mom. And they're like, yes, yeah, search and rescue will come. I was like, no, she's like literally above me. Like she's on top of rubble, like I swear. So I pointed um, where they were, like where she was in a general area and like they found her. She was probably like, 15 or 20 feet yes. above her. Correct. Yeah. So, so then I went up to her yes. and then yeah. they we stayed took... with, uh, with Devin. They said I was just covered from head to toe in dust that they would have never found me as quickly as they did. When Walker found Angela, he said she was in and out of consciousness and appeared to be slipping away. You could tell she was bleeding internally because she was very, very pale. It's kind of a, a lethargic. Um, and I, I just kind of knew that she was, you know, probably worse off than, than Devin was. 
if, if Devin hadn't pointed to say, I think my mom's over there, would you have found her as quickly? No. No, because we would have focused, I think we would have focused on getting Devin, yeah. Devin out. We probably would and have. And then we would have returned to look for more survivors. Yeah. That time was critical and likely saved Angela's life. As Walker stayed with Angela, Jones and Tomsick wanted to get Devin off the pile as quickly as possible, still concerned the rest of the building is going to collapse. Tyler and I looked at each other and we're kind of just trying to figure out how we are going to get Devin down. So we decided to throw her on Tyler's back and um, we told her this is going to hurt. It's not going to be pleasant, but we have to do it. Uh, we really need your help. You're going to need to hold on with your right leg and your arm. And I turned backwards and I tried to stabilize her leg and I held her leg and I, kind, and I guided him down. She's bleeding. She's bleeding. She did really good. She was pretty tough. One point she screamed. One point, yes. We had like a, I guess a gap to get down. Yeah. And it was a little bit difficult, and she screamed at that point. But she held on tight the rest of the way. Very, very tough. She was very tough. They had to give me, like, a half piggyback ride because one had to hold this leg up, and the other leg I had to, like, wrap it around the firefighter. I can't imagine the pain that she was in. Jones radioed for firefighters to meet her at the bottom of the pile to take Devin to an ambulance. And we put her down right at the bottom of the pile. They turned and ran back up the pile to where Angela and Walker were waiting. We knew Scotty was up there, so he needed help. When they got to Walker and Angela, and not knowing she had shattered her pelvis in the fall, the firefighters tried to get her to stand. She was screaming in pain. Um, she's very close to the building, so there's these very large AC units on top, and there were things falling. There were things falling very close to us. Um, She's screaming. She was telling us not to move her. I had this moment where I was just like, we have to get this done. So I told her that her daughter was a champ, that her daughter like was already, like, look where she is. She's already down there. We have to get you to her. We have to do this right now. Like, I need you to suck it up for this little bit of time. Like, there's just, there's no, like, we're not doing this back and forth. I'm not doing it. Like, we have to go now. And that was it. Now they had to figure out how to get her down. We basically <laughs> piggybacked her between yes. me and Tyler, so I would, I would carry her, carry. lift her, and then pass her on to Tyler, and then sneak behind him, yes. grab her again. And then I was, think it was maybe like halfway three, down. Halfway down. Uh, the guys from Seven Somebody came showed up. And we found. And then, yeah, we found a, it was like a, like a, was a, a tabletop a table or, top? you know, it was a, a long piece of wood, a rectangular piece of wood. And we'd load her up on that and then carried her off on top yes. of that because it was easier that way. Now 19, we're bringing up one more patient, one more red. It's going to be uh, the mom. As Devin waited at the bottom of the pile, she saw Jones, Walker, and Tomsick carrying her mother. I think they had to use like a door that they found or like a huge piece of like wood because if not, they couldn't carry her down. And after, because she left before, before me. So after she left and I knew she was safe, I said, okay guys, um, now you guys have to like find my dad next. But there was no sign of Edgar. When we come back, a family broken. That's kind of the, the hardest part for me from, of that night. Um, Cause there was just no time to do anything except just grab her and scream, run. Angela Gonzalez and her 15-year-old daughter, Devin, were thrown from their ninth floor condo in the Champlain Towers, landing on the debris pile below and leaving them with serious injuries. It would be 45 minutes before they were carried off the pile by the crew from Station 19. Once Lieutenant Corey Jones knew Angela and Devin were safe, she heard on her radio firefighters were working to free a woman and her young son. All right, we got active people trapped on the rubble on the north east side of the building. 
By the time Jones arrived, and you can see her here in this video wearing the red helmet, Jonah Handler was gone, and the crews were desperately trying to free his mother, Stacy. We were working to try to get her out. She was talking to us the whole time. She was pinned under a large slab of concrete. We were going through a bunch of different ideas, just back and forth. Um, I had one firefighter on this side working a set of tools and one on this side um, and trying to come up with, you know, plan B, plan C, what are other things we can do. They were able to get her free, but her injuries were too severe. She died a short time later on her way to the hospital. She was the first official victim of the Surfside collapse. It's frustrating because we worked very hard for such a long time and um, we, we, we put a lot of effort into it. Um, and then we had our next job. As one of the few teens in a building with older tenants, Devin and Jonah did know each other. We went to the same middle school. Um, we weren't super close friends. We were more like acquaintances. Like we knew each other's names. We like hung out once. We always saw each other like in the elevator when he was with his mom. But his mom was really nice. I liked his mom, his mom. His mom would like say hi to me every time she saw me. Although they weren't close, their stories since the collapse are remarkably similar. While Devin has focused on volleyball, Jonah worked hard to get back onto the baseball diamond. Uh, well, before this happened, he was a rock star. <laughs> you know, now he, you know, it took, it set him back a bit, quite a bit. Neil Handler is Jonah's father. He's been working hard, and it's hard for him to work hard, but he's been doing it. Well, especially, I don't think people fully understood the injuries that he sustained. Listen, he broke 12 vertebrae in his back. I mean, the fact that he's even walking is a miracle, you know. Um, I can honestly say that just watching him train and everything over the last few months, it's, he's finally maybe at a place where he's, you know, starting to get back to his old self. You know, but he's sick today and he's in bed and he, he called me before, he goes, my back hurts. I said, so get up and stretch, you know, like, that injury is going to be with him forever. Kids are resilient, and I have the highest hopes for him, but I hear that we have to be careful. Neil Handler and Stacy Fang divorced when Jonah was two. Prior to the collapse, Jonah would shuttle between his mother's condo in the Champlain Towers South and his father's condo in the Champlain Towers North, just a little more than 100 yards away. The night of the collapse, Neil was awakened by a call from Jonah shortly after 2 a.m when he had been carried out of the rubble. And he calls me up in like this panic, Dad, where are you, Dad? Didn't you hear the building collapse? I'm like, what are you talking about? I go, he goes, the building collapsed. I go, what building? He goes, Mommy's building. I go, where are you? He goes, I'm in the grass across the street. I said, where's Mommy? He goes, I don't know. Neil raced downstairs and found his son being treated by paramedics across the street. He put him on a stretcher and uh, put him in the ambulance and I got in it with him. I asked him where is, where is his mom, and um, an ambulance had taken off right before we did, and I'm assuming that she was in it. Um, we got to Aventura Hospital, and um, they said there was a woman in the other room, and that she didn't make it, but they wouldn't identify it. They couldn't tell us if it was her or not. Despite whatever disagreements they had, Neil said he knew Stacy was a good mom. First and foremost for both of us was Jonah. And I tell him all the time, I go, as crazy as I am or as your mom was, you got the best of both of us, you know? So I'm truly blessed that, you know, that we raised a really, really solid kid. Once off the pile, Devin and Angela were taken to Jackson Memorial Hospital where they underwent emergency surgery. Angela was in a coma for three days. When she came out of it, she awoke in fright, still hearing Devin's screams from the pile in her mind. But when I woke up in ICU in the coma, it, I could hear her still screaming for me. It took about two days for me to calm down. Um, 
the, you know, when, I think it was when um, Edgar's father was in the room with me that I just kept saying, Poppy, she, she's Devin, find Devin, she's, she needs my help, she's screaming, and he would have to tell me, no, it's okay, she's not here, it's in your mind. Um, and then once he was able to tell me that a few times, you know, then it started to, to dissipate, but it took about two days because I could just still hear her screaming. She was told Devin was safe, but Edgar was missing. She thought about the last time she saw him. He was still in bed next to Devin. Um, that's kind of the, the hardest part for me from of that night. Um, Cause there was just no time to do anything except just grab her and scream, run. Um, so I still saw him in bed as it was starting to come down. So I, that's where my mind goes. I just wish there was more I could have done. I wish there was something I could have done to um, wake him up. Yeah. But it's natural. You went for your daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if he had woken up first, he probably would have done the same thing. He would. And I know I did exactly um, what he's always, you know, when those causal conversations come up, you know, when you see something traumatic. And I know I did what he would have wanted me to do. But my, my heart wishes I could have done more. Yeah. Um, Does it but I know I couldn't. I know if I hesitated a second, you know, we barely made it out as it is. Yeah. It would be more than two weeks before Edgar's body was found. What do you remember most about your dad? He modeled. Sorry. He kind of modeled to me how, uh, no, don't be in frame, please. That's not going to help. Um, he modeled to me how, like, you're how a guy is supposed to treat a woman, because um, I know some kids can't say this, like, they saw, like, having, like, two parents in a home or, like, two parents, like, that love each other and stuff, but that was my mom and dad. They really modeled, or he did how a girl, like, a woman should be treated how, like, my husband or future husband's supposed to treat me. They were like really good for each other. They brought out the best in each other. And um, I don't know, he just, he would do anything for us. Like, like that's just who he was. Like he did stuff for other people more than himself. After Devin and Angela were taken to the hospital, Taylor came home to find their building had collapsed. After searching the Surfside Community Center where survivors were gathering, She returned to the site. I was crying and I realized that like our part of the building was not there anymore. Um, and one, a police officer said, oh, well, if they're on that site, then they didn't make it. So for a good hour, hour and a half, I thought that I lost all three of them, that like I, that they all didn't make it. So my cousin and I were crying and like I was just like screaming and sobbing like on the side of the road for a good hour. <laughs> a security guard on the night shift, however, saw Devin being taken away by paramedics and called her aunt. So my aunt called me and said, your sister's on the way to the hospital, like we need to go right now. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of, at first was freaking out because I was just like, well, okay, like Devin's okay. So where's my mom and my dad? Um, but then like I kind of came to my senses and I, like after like 10 minutes, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna go to the hospital because Devin's there by herself. So I rushed to the hospital um, and she was still in the emergency section uh, screaming like on the top of her lungs because she was in like so much pain. It wasn't until Taylor arrived at the hospital that she realized her mother was also alive. They're, I think, strong girls. You know, Edgar and I would always get into these conversations, you know, like, are you doing the right thing? And questioning your parenting and 
I'm really proud of them, and I know he's really proud of them. They've really pulled together, supporting each other. After our interview, Angela noted how you could see Devin withdrawing and starting to shut down. Devin tends to be more like her father and doesn't show a lot of emotions, a trait that worries her mother and adds to her own sense of guilt. I wasn't able to be the mom that they normally would have had in a situation like this. So in the beginning, when I, was, when I had all those injuries, I think a lot of it was because I couldn't mother and nurture them the way that, definitely the way that they needed because, you know, I'm in the hospital, I'm in the ICU, I'm on all these different medications, I'm injured, I'm in pain. Um, but I think as I've healed and gotten stronger, she's been able to to feel a little bit more. I, I had more nightmares when I was first in the hospital. I had a lot of trouble falling asleep. Now it's just when there's like thunderstorms. Yeah. Because Devin had such trouble falling asleep in the hospital, Taylor would climb into bed with her. She would just wake up in like a panic and just start sobbing, saying that just stuff about dad. Here again, you see the similarities between Devin and Jonah's experiences since the collapse. Talk to me about what thunder does for him. It puts him through the roof. His anxiety level goes to, a, it's the hardest thing as a parent to watch. I mean, to look at him in his face when the thunder rumbles and to see that terror in his eyes, I can't, there's no words to it. I mean, you know, it's the most powerless feeling I've ever felt in my life to not be able to help him or calm him down. Um, you know, when it thunders, we don't stay here. I'm driving around for two hours till it stops raining with him because he just can't be anywhere near a building. Not in a building, near a building. I mean, we were down in Brickle for lunch, for brunch one day, and it started raining. It was just drizzling, and I started to see him shift. And I said, are you okay? He goes, it's raining, Dad, we gotta go. I go, it's drizzling, baby. The sun's, it's, it's not even cloudy out, it's just like a sun shower. He goes, Dad, it's raining, we gotta go. I said, but I go, we're not even inside a building, we're outside on the sidewalk. He goes, look around us. You see all these buildings? I mean, it's bad. It's not, it's, it's not um, something I would wish on anybody. And um, there's nothing I can do. Neil also wonders if he has made the right choices to help Jonah in his recovery especially the decision to stay in the Champlain Towers North. For the first four or five months, I was looking every day for a place to live. Um, but I stayed here because this was his second home. I wanted him to stay in a routine that was familiar to him and surroundings that were familiar to him. I wanted him to um, not run away from it. And I don't know, I'm hoping I did the right thing. In the end, all any family can do is to try and be there for each other, as Devin showed just days after the collapse. I think I practiced this like the entire night, by the way. You did. Okay. You have an audience, too. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm getting nervous now. <laughs> Thirteen days after the collapse, Devin played her mother the Sam Smith song, Stay With Me. stay with me sound like both a plea to her mother and a prayer for her father who in that moment was still missing buried beneath the rubble. I, I feel like when I first woke up from the coma my initial thoughts were um, he wasn't with us anymore. I just felt it deep in my heart and just that 
panic of me waking up. Um, but then my, my heart was then just hoping, you know, I do know if there was anybody who had the, just the determination if they were under there, he would have been determined in all his power to try to survive. So I, so after a couple of days, I was really putting my heart into that. Like if daddy is under there and, and, and if he made pockets. it, if there's hair, air pockets and, he, and he's under one, you know, he's fighting for us. A Miami-Dade detective came to Angela's hospital room to tell her when her husband's remains were identified. We were heartbroken, yeah. It was def it's devastating, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but I think for us, it's it was still hard to really grieve even during that time period, just because of our injuries. The search crews recovered the titanium wedding ring he was wearing and gave it to Angela. For months, Angela, Devin, and Taylor took turns wearing the ring on a chain around their necks. You know, I did go through a season where it was not good. It was dark and it was, um, I think there's an unspoken like thing to, where we all just know who needs to step up more yeah. or who needs more taking care of that day or week. On July 23rd, with Angela still in a wheelchair and Devin on crutches, a funeral was held for Edgar Gonzalez. He was 44. Throughout the service, Angela, Devin, and Taylor relied on each other to make it through the day. Yeah, but you never imagine you're ever gonna be put in that situation and have to live through that. There was some good news rivaling their own miraculous survival. Although their dog, Daisy, died, their cat, Binks, somehow survived the collapse. Ew. Ew. Yes, she's the one I've been talking to, so she's good. As soon as my mom came, I guess her senses after her coma, she said, where's Binks? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, you know he survived. We all made it a mission for like a good week mm -hmm. to try to find him. Firefighters found Binks on the pile, but thinking it was a neighborhood stray, took it to a nearby park. They kept grabbing him from the rubble and putting him in the park <coughs> next to the house because um, there's a lot of like stray cats there. But he kept going to the same section and it was actually where they found my dad and um, Daisy, our mm -hmm. dog but he kept going and just staying in that area the whole time. They finally realized he might be from the building and took him to the county shelter where Taylor found him. I don't know. Is that him? I don't know. Looks like he's got his Mr. Beer and stuff. Yeah. He's got the bones part of here. I think it is him, yeah. yeah. It is him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This black cat has become their good luck charm and has been another part of the family's recovery. He doesn't like for people to get too upset. So if I um, raise my voice a little bit and I'm reprimanding either of them or crying, or crying he comes running in and will just meow at you and, until you get distracted. Um, and just with like emotions, if, if one of us is crying, he'll come over, lay on your chest, He's almost like an emotional support cat now. He's just really in, engaged with us. He's just like another miracle. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm almost certain though, the way Binks is, the moment I heard a noise, he heard the noise, and wherever we're running, he was running. So that's why I just knew the moment I woke up, I was like, I know Binks made it. He had to have made it. <laughs> um, that's, and that's how he is now. He'll just, you know. When we come back, the drive to play again. For me, the, 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 the thing that I just keep envisioning over and over is that time um, when Devin gets back on the court to really jump in that game and crush the ball. for Devin has been a long and difficult one. She drove herself to get better. Just three weeks after the collapse and her leg bandaged and only able to walk with crutches, 
she worked a few basic volleyball moves into her physical therapy. Volleyball became the driving force behind both Devin and Angela's recovery. Because I just know she loves it, and I wanted to try my hardest to keep somewhat of her old life. I know that that's what she needs. So for me as a mom, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about how to give them back some of their losses. Some losses I can't ever replace, um, but volleyball is one that I feel like you know, she loves it. It kind of reminds her about her old life. And it was something that her and her dad, they, you know, he was very passionate about, we were, we're a volleyball family, you know, that's what I always say, but he was passionate about volleyball. He was at every game. Before the collapse, Devin was a beast on the volleyball court. She would leap high above the net and either spike the ball or block an opponent's shot. And she was just very determined, fearless. She did everything we asked her to do. She worked her butt off. Two, good. Three, rotate, good. Straight line, straight, good. Step, push, toes forward, left leg push. Left leg push, good. Three months after the collapse, Devin started working with her volleyball coaches, doing limited drills and needing to sit often. Dave Palm and Amy Morgan are two of her volleyball coaches. For me, the, 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 the thing that I just keep envisioning over and over is that time um, when Devin gets back on the court to really jump in that game and crush the ball. Yeah! And I want to be there for her. And I know I'm going to celebrate and jump on the court to see that because nobody else can see that. That's the only thing I envision every single time. Morgan recalls what it was like when Devin's teammates gathered the day after the collapse to FaceTime with Devin from the hospital. It was rough. We all broke down. We all, the parents came in, the girls came in, we all sat around and we all held hands, we all hugged, we prayed. It was a really rough, really rough practice. And it's, it tears your heart apart knowing that you can't do anything, you can't take her pain away. And that's probably the hardest thing for me is I love my girls, you know, they're like my own kids. And when you can't take their pain away, you try everything you can to do, make it better, but what can you do? Just be there for them and support them. And I know if anybody can make it back from something like this, it's gonna be Devin. He gathers to honor the victims of the Surfside condo collapse. In October, Devin returned to the volleyball court to offer a ceremonial serve before limping off the court. <laughs> it was a special moment she shared not only with her teammates, but with Tomsick, Jones, and Walker, the firefighters who rescued her. I feel like we've made friends or like family really um, for life. And um, it's a bond that is not gonna go away. But a new complication developed. The rod and her leg bent, causing her to walk with a painful limp. She underwent her second surgery in November. Yeah, look who's Good walking. job. And within days, the staff had her up and walking around. After her second surgery, she was back at it, but this time in a harness to give her leg additional support. And the other side. Every step of the way, Angela has been there, even as she herself struggled to get better. She spent three days in a coma and then weeks in the hospital. Okay, I got you. When she was released, she was confined to a wheelchair. In August, eight weeks after the collapse, she stood up on her own for the first time to the cheers of her family. Well, I wanted out of that wheelchair. I, yeah, I just, um, I just felt like it, me not being able to get up and doing things was, that was hard for me, not being able to do things for them. Last month, Devin and Angela met with Devin's surgeon to go over her progress. That's called your IT band. It goes all the way from your hip down. So that's and I think it maybe is rubbing over maybe this metal and it, that's what bothered you. Maybe. But yeah, the x-rays look great. It's healing. I think healing sufficiently enough that I can tell you what you want to hear, which is <laughs> you can do essentially whatever you want. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. Well, you know what she's really asking now. You want to play volleyball? Yes. Yeah. She wants to jump. Yeah, do it. Angela was more cautious. Well, 
you're not going to go straight into doing like massive progressive pro it's progressive because i already know what you're thinking in your mind and dave's already told you that you're not like going to practice tomorrow and doing a full out approach jump and hit it's progression a few days later her physical therapist kelly terry was amazed at how far she had come kick up as hard as you can if you got pain you can slow down but you for the most part start? no i got it i can squeeze it Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Do you know what you had before? No. 17 pounds. What'd she get? 40. 40. As fast as Devin wants to move, those around her remain very protective. Step, here we go. Step, six, good. Almost done. Step, stay down. Toes forward, seven. I know that your doctor gave you clearance to run and jump. We're going to introduce some of those movements today, but I'll say let's not incorporate it in training on your own yet because I want to get your strength a little bit higher. While her trainers are used to working with injured athletes, the nature of what she's been through is closer to a soldier who suffered a traumatic injury in battle. There are times during their session where you can see the pain on Devin's face. I think the extent of the injury and also the circumstances that which it happened is pretty unimaginable. I've seen a lot of athletes go through a lot of things, injuries with their sports and things like that, but um, this is just a whole nother level. Terry has little doubt she'll be back to her athletic form on the court. Being a high level athlete, we can't just get her back to walking and being able to tolerate going up and down stairs. She needs to jump and smash some balls and be able to move on the court. Our goals are a lot higher for her as an athlete and a young athlete who was getting recruited to all these schools and I'm confident that we can get her back to that. At the end of her session, Terry allows Devin to do something she's waited 11 months to do, jump. Okay. You pretty much jumped over it. Too easy. The sense of joy is palpable as she continues to jump and land, shaky at first and then more solidly. Oh, that was a little harder. Okay. Harder, but that was great. Great, great, great. Even in this moment, her father is with her. Note the gold-colored Ric Flair Adidas sneakers. Her dad gave her a pair just like them, but they were lost in the collapse. A family friend bought her a new pair, and she wears them all the time. But no place makes Devin happier than being at the Tribe Volleyball Training Facility in Broward. You're not jumping. Those are calf jumps. Those are not real jumps. Okay, I want to do a calf jump. Then. And then what happens when your Achilles oh, we're not ruptures? Mike. I'm not Mike. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Mike, Mike has had. He's much older. <laughs> much older. And he, uh, he's had some strong He didn't listen to his body either. Exactly. It's always been my second home. And it's like, to me, from like a like traumatic ex perspective, it's like I didn't lose everything. You really do light up when you talk about it. Yeah, I love volleyball. Yeah. I love it. So what do you love about volleyball? Um, oh my god, that's a really hard question. What do I love about it? I do love the team aspect. It's like, um, cause at one point in my life I did struggle with bullying in middle school and like I felt like I had no friends, but like with the team aspect, like that's like your real friends like and family because like you're, you're on the court together, you lose together, you win together. When someone else gets injured, you're like all together. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's one thing I love about it. Definitely. The other thing is like, I'm, I love competitive sports. I like being against someone. I like proving myself. I like feeling like I'm the best. So I like that, especially it like brings up your confidence a little bit. Playing volleyball is a reminder of the life she had with her father. Ah, I feel like this is like another way I connect to him, you know, because both my mom and my dad came to every tournament. Even before the collapse, Devin wore the same number on her jersey that her father wore when he played football for Columbus. Edgar had a sound he would make, like a dog barking every time Devin did something good on the court. Hey, she still hears his voice booming through the facility. Do you feel your dad watching you on, when you're out here? Definitely. I feel him watching every day, especially at volleyball. He was one of my favorite dads. <laughs> he was very jovial, full of life, so positive, and he was he was awesome, and he was one of Devin's biggest supporters. <laughs> um, he wanted to be here and 
see Devin really succeed. <laughs> it's just, uh, I'm heartbroken for her. You know, he should be here. And I know she's doing this for him. She's doing it for herself, but she's doing it for him. She, he really wanted this for her. When she comes out of it, it's really gonna be something where she's just gonna be a strong young lady, a strong woman knowing that I did this, yes, I had help, but ultimately she has to make the decision to wake up every morning, go to practice, try, uh, go to tryouts, do her work, her PT, eat right. And I think that alone is just showing a, de a demonstration of what type of person she's gonna become later on. She'll be able to overcome anything, anything. As Angela watches Devin practice, she sees Devin reclaiming the life she had before the collapse. And she gets to be the volleyball mom she used to be. She's here, she's just with all her friends, her closest friends. Um, she's connected a bond with probably every coach here. And um, it's, it's home. Yeah, and we get to feel close to her dad too, because he was, he was involved just like me, so yeah. So I think too, it allows her to have that familiarity of her old life, where I'm the volleyball mom. Um, you know, there's no mercy when it comes to volleyball. So although I know she's grieving and she's sad and you know working through a lot of trauma, but when it's time to step up for volleyball, I'm there's no mercy. <laughs> Sounds horrible. No, <laughs> but, <laughs> no, no, no. But that's how, but that drive is important. It is. It's yeah. And she, she feeds off it. That's, you know, so we were allowed to mourn and we can be sad, but when it's time to step up for volleyball, it, you know, she does it. It's also a reminder of a life she'll never have again with a man she called her best friend. It's hard. It's definitely hard. Um, but I kind of, um, I just choose to be, I don't know what the word would be, you know, I, you, you gotta have a little bit of courage to like sit in the pain a little bit and then, which is being here without him. but then it allows you to just feel like his presence in it, you know, like he, he would be passionate about her recovery too. If, if it was vice versa and I wasn't here, he would be here doing the same thing. We're positive. Um, yeah, giving, giving up is not an option in our family. That's just something we gotta go 100%. And if it doesn't work, we could choose something else, but we just don't give up. Um, and that's what we're doing here.